Hi, welcome to tonight's um, coverage. Uh, we're continuing coverage of the 2018 general elections. Um, 100 candidates, 30 um, nights of forums, 60 forums, and tonight we have the candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. We have incumbent um, Democrat Peter Welch. We have Republican challenger Anya Tinio. We have Laura Potter, who is a uh, Liberty, Union, Liberty Party. Union Party candidate and independent candidate Chris Erickson. And we're going to start, and we will start, we'll go down this way um, with introductions and give us a, you know, a minute and a half, tell us who you are, um, <coughs> why you are running, and what qualifies you for the position. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Anya Tino. I'm running for U.S. House. I'm running because I know that we can have better representation in Washington, more comprehensive representation. I believe in constitutional rights, Second Amendment, a stronger economy, and strengthening our agricultural community. I know that I can be a strong leader for the state of Vermont. I can put my working class background to work. And I work very hard, and I will work hard for you as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Peter Welch, and I'd like to have the opportunity to continue serving uh, in Washington on behalf of Vermonters. Uh, we've got a very serious situation right now in our democracy. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety as to whether the norms that we have that require, even amidst our serious differences about how we address economic issues and political issues, whether we're going to have the mutual respect that's absolutely essential to use the political process to accomplish things that are really important for our country. And my commitment since I served in the State Senate and all the time I served in Congress is to focus on practical solutions, working with people to try to make progress. The second thing is that as much as our economy has, has been doing better, unemployment is low, the stock market until just recently is way up, wages aren't up. So for most working Americans, at least half, they haven't seen a pay raise in about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that income inequality is an <coughs> is, is enormous uh, anxiety provoker for people who are trying to take care of their kids and themselves. But it's also a kind of thing in a democracy that we don't want. The pride of our democracy is that we've had an economy that works for everybody. And I want to work on behalf of restoring and revitalizing the middle class. Thank you. Yes, I'm Chris Erickson. My website is indyvt.com, I-N-D-Y-V-T.com. I've never met half of the candidates here before because I've been excluded from the majority of debates and forums. I'm here to tell you that both the Republicans and the Democrats are ripping us off in the United States Congress. Your taxpayer dollars are gouged out of your paycheck. They go to Washington, D.C. The United States Congress votes to give your tax dollars by the billions to the NIH National Institute of Health. They vote to give your tax dollars by the billions to the Pentagon. The NIH gives millions to each of the pharmaceutical companies. The Pentagon gives millions to each of the defense contractors. They make a profit using your tax dollars. They make trillions and trillions and trillions of profit. Where is your ROI, return on investment, for your taxpayer dollars? If you're a well-to-do person, you buy shares of stock in the pharmaceutical companies and the defense corporations. And you get an ROI, return on investment. You get a dividend. You get money back. But the taxpayers are not getting any money back on their investment. They're getting ripped off, and it's the Republicans and the Democrats who are ripping you off. They're making the rich richer and the poor poorer, and they're doing it on purpose. Vote for me, Chris Erickson, independent. Thank you. Perfect. Spot on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Laura? Okay. Um, I'm Laura Potter. I'm the Liberty Union candidate for the... Uh, U.S. House, and I'm mostly here to give people other options because at this very table we have Democrat, we have Republican. There's not that much difference between the two parties. You know, we have someone who's gone out on her own as an independent. In my particular case, I've, I'm with the Liberty Union Party. You know, we need more parties, not just the two big ones, 
that seem to be controlling everything. There are people who are homeless and dying when there are so many resources that could be put out to the people. Isn't that what our nation is supposed to be about? Taking care of our people? It's not happening. It needs to happen or we're just going to go, you know, spinning down the, the toilet drain and I mean, we've been through depressions, recessions, and who gets some money out of all those? You know, the people who have money to start with, buying when things are low, and then they become filthy rich when things build back up again. But more and more, I mean, in my lifetime, I have, I've seen this huge middle class, a lot of union people, you know, and now what do we have? We have a lower class and an upper class. Thank you very um, much, Laura. And I think everybody's got it. We didn't really get to talk at the beginning, but you'll see a red light on the camera. So if you want to speak right to the camera, you find the one with the red light. Great. So, so that's good. thanks Thank for you. that. Um, so following up on that, that's a great segue into the first question, which is arguably uh, the country is pretty politicized and par in a partisan way right now and Washington as well. Um, so considering, um, and we're not sure what's gonna happen in the midterm elections, so considering how, um, what gridlock there could be in Washington, how can you deliver on the promises that you would like to bring to Vermonters? How do you expect to bridge that gap in Washington? And we'll start with you, and then we'll go around. Um, well, first, um, Congress is broken. And in the past four years, I'll give an example. Uh, we passed the health care bill, and that was a number in 2010, and uh, actually a little before that. And then there was an effort to repeal it. It was very controversial. And when we had a hearing, actually we had the committee meeting on the question of repealing the health care bill, we went in the committee at 10 o'clock in the morning. Doors are locked. We're there for 27 hours. That's the first time the bill was passed out. There was never a committee hearing allowing us to look at it. And I'm not talking just about Democrats didn't see it. Republicans didn't see it. Just the folks who were in the Speaker's office when it was written. You can't do legislation when it's done in secret, not as opposed to in the open committee. So one of the things we have to do in Congress is get back to an open process in the committee where the authority is with the committees, not so much just in the Speaker's office. And that's true whether it's Republican or Democrat. The other thing is that each of us individually has to really accept the fact that people would disagree with us aren't necessarily, they have the same goal of making this country a better place. So there's got to be mutual respect and that is as true in Congress as it is in our own personal lives. So I think those are two essential things. Have it be an open process that in the terms of Congress is regular order where it's in the committee as opposed to just done in secret. Uh, and second, there's gotta be on both sides, all sides mutual respect. Thank you very much. Chris? I'm going to go into the United States Congress, and I'm going to very first, first and foremost, st start a bill to get ROI, return on investment. And again, return on investment is the taxpayers are forced by the United States Congress to give billions to the National Institute of Health. They're forced to give billions to the Pentagon. The National Institute of Health turns around and gives millions to each of the pharmaceutical companies. The Pentagon turns around and gives millions to each of the defense contractors. And they turn around and make products which they earn trillions of dollars on. And the, the public aren't getting an ROI, a return on investment, the same as if they bought shares of stocks and got stock dividends. So first, I'm going to sponsor a bill to demand ROI. And then, because the majority of Congress are Republicans and Democrats, I don't expect them to go along with it right away. I'm going to go to all 50 state governors, and I'm going to hold a conference of all 50 state governors and say, look, you need money for health care. You need money for education. You need money for roads and bridges. You need money for low-cost housing. And where's that money? 
That's ROI, the return on investment that each state deserves. Because if I can get 50% of the trillions of dollars that the pharmaceutical companies are making and divide that between the 50 states and get 50% of the money that the defense corporations are making and the, divide that between the 50 states, then each of the 50 states will have the money they need for health care, education, roads and bridges, and low-cost housing. So I will get all 50 state governors to sign a petition supporting my plan for ROI for return on investment, and then I'll go and ask the representatives of Congress to co-sponsor the bill with me. Thank you. Could I ask you to repeat the question, Yeah, Laura, please? so um, the, the issue is the partisan divide in Washington. How would you bring people together across that divide to get the job done to, for Vermonters? Well, the big thing is are the people in there actually interested in, uh, in getting a job done, or are they interested in just being at loggerheads? Mm -hmm. um, over the years, people have called me the peacemaker because you know, I'm the one that can get the two sides talking. They may still duke it out eventually, but at least, you know, at least they can get talking because I'm willing to listen to both sides and then make a decision based on what I'm listening to. Um, and that, that initially is what I would be pushing among my colleagues in, the, in Congress is enough of, enough of the loggerheads. You know, we all want the good, so why aren't we putting solutions up, solutions that both sides, you know, or in my view, all sides, can work with. You know, it's, uh, and I'm a bit of a gadfly. I see something fishy going on, I'm likely to point it out to you. You know, if someone's trying to lie to me and I see it in their eyes, I'll call them on it right then and there. And some of these, one of the big things I'm also pushing for is term limits because there are people in Congress right now who have spent their whole careers better than half my life in that position. That needs to end. And we need, you know, we need the diehards to get out so that the, you know, so new blood can actually work Thank something you. out. Thank you very much. Anya? <clears throat> yes. Uh, first of all, I will say that I think that common sense transcends political divides. I work to be a very reasonable person. Um, I have friends that are Democrats, so I'm by no means foreign to working with them and talking with them. And I do know that bipartisanship is necessary to achieve the goals that we all want to. We need to be able to work together, have comprehensive dialogue. We will disagree on things, but we can also agree on many things, and that's very important. And I think that it's more important to focus on what unites us than what <coughs> divides us. I do believe that we're less divided now than that we once were, and that we can continue to work towards a common goal, and that is what we all want, the betterment of, of our country and making sure that our country is safe and secure for our citizens, and doing the very best that we can to provide that, provide that in Washington. That's what I believe. I'm sure Mr. Welsh can agree that yeah. there are different things that are you need to be other done. Other places you see that happening in Vermont currently? Well, if I was going to point to one instance, I'd say uh, Lucy Rogers and Zach Mayo, who just made national mm -hmm. news. <laughs> they um, made a statement about wanting to have less divisiveness, and I think that that was very well done yep. for them. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Congressman Welch referenced health care um, and the health care bill as a place where neither Republicans or Democrats got to see that before it came. Um, so the next question that I'm going to ask is about, um, do you think health care is a fundamental right for all Americans? And um, if not, why? Or, you know, how do you respond to that? And if so, what action can you take in Congress? Um, to ensure that, especially in light of what's going on, um, to dismantle what we refer to as Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. And we'll start with you, Chris Erickson, health care. Thank you. 
For, for health care, back to my ROI, return on investment plan. We pay our taxes to the federal government. The federal government allows the United States Congress, which is in charge of bills that to do with money. The U.S. Congress gives our tax dollars to the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Health gives our money to the various, various pharmaceutical corporations. The pharmaceutical corporations use our money for research, design, and development of pharmaceutical prescription drugs and medical devices which they sell worldwide for trillions of dollars of profit. Now let's back up. We're paying for the research, design, and development. That means when, when you're looking at a picture of a prescription, it may have a diagram that it's got a C, an O, and an H. They, they come in diagrams that you get with your prescription. And that diagram is copyrighted. Everything that is a design, a blueprint, or a uh, diagram, a blueprint, um, anything in print is all copyrighted. Now under United States copyright law, copyright law sits squarely with work made for hire law. When you work for a corporation and, and you design something, the, the, the employer owns what you design. The employer owns the copyright because the employer paid for your work, paid you a salary. So as taxpayers, we are paying for the copyrights, therefore we should own them and we deserve a right to a and profit. And is healthcare a human right? Pardon me? Is healthcare a human right? Yes. Great, thank you so much. And Laura Potter. Absolutely. Um, the others have already put bills into Congress and also in various states in the direction of the universal health care. I'm absolutely for it. Um, I have seen through the years where depending on what company my employer went with or what I could afford, I watch health care just gradually get more expensive and less care. Um, you may have seen I came in on crutches. I've been on those for 20 years because insurance companies kept jerking me around and so what would have been simply treated Lyme disease and other uh, Lyme tick, tick diseases ended up being a permanent disability to me. Um, I've just seen too much of it where, you know, the monies go up, the health care goes down, we need to bring that back to where the health care is, it's a right. You know, everybody deserves the right to have at least a, an adequate amount of health care. And with the type of money we're talking in this nation, we can have more than just adequate. We, we need health care that will take care of most anything, you know, for everybody. So the poor person, the rich person, they get it all. Thank you so much. Anya, yes. health care is a human right. Yeah. Everybody deserves to have health care. Whether the government can afford to pay for that or not is a different question. Mm. So what I would say is that it's very important to have competition in health care. You have to have competition. You have to make sure that you're not the only game in town. Otherwise, the rates will never be checked or balanced. As I said, everybody deserves to have health care currently. You cannot be turned away from a hospital if you are in need and you will receive health care. But it is necessary to take into consideration that you are simply taking out the middleman for single payer health care. It's necessary to understand that the government cannot afford to pay for everyone's health care and remain fiscally viable. We do need to create a system where independent insurance takes over a great deal of our health care system. And I would think that even moving people off Medicare into independent insurance once it was affordable would be something that would be beneficial to this nation. Don't really have anything more on that. Shave <laughs> some off of the military budget and you could pay for all of it. I'm not in favor of def cutting defense spending. We, we ha spend 10 times what anyone else in the world does. Of course we can shave some off without affecting our defense. We could look at possibly streamlining it, but we do not need to weaken our defense system.
Thank you so much, Congressman Welch. Well, I do believe health care is a right. It's like education is a right. Uh, any strong society needs <clears throat> to make certain that all of its citizens have access to the health care that they need and have access to the education they need. I mean, the truth about our health care system here um, is that it's the most expensive in the world and we don't get the best results. I mean, we, there, there are places you get really good health care. But we spend twice as much as most of our uh, industrialized peers. And we have more people who are not getting access to health care, and it's incredibly expensive, and that's what's killing us. Uh, I would never cut Medicare. That has been a godsend for uh, folks 65 and over. I didn't say cut it. <laughs> well, you said move to private insurance, and I, uh, to, I would see that as really gutting it. Because uh, what's wonderful about Medicare a choice. is that is that folks know they have that security that they can get the care they need from the doctor they want. The government pays, it's with your contributions in mind, it's, you know, we pay into the Medicare fund, but I get to choose what doctor I go to, I get to choose uh, what hospital I go to, and that has provided an enormous uh, uh, security for, uh, for folks 65 and old, over. And I'd really like to see uh, Medicare for all system where everybody has some confidence. If somebody's moving from job A to job B, they didn't have to fear that they'd leave their health care behind. Uh, so I think that would really be good for our, our society. And the fact is that health care is too expensive. It's too expensive for taxpayers, uh, it's too expensive for employers, and it's too expensive for individuals. We've got to bring down that cost, including pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. So um, we're going to take <coughs> a call from um, our viewers. Sure. And let's see if I can remember how to do this. I should know how. <laughs> I tell people all the time. Welcome. You're on the air. Uh, how, uh, what question do you have for the candidates? Hello. Hello. Do you have a oh. question for the candidates? I do. Um, I'm not watching, so hopefully they haven't already gone over this. Um, in fact, I'm lucky to even catch you guys. But I was wondering how they feel about legalizing metal, uh, marijuana at the federal level and uh, if, if they approve how, how fast they think they could get the job done because <coughs> The people seem to be uh, slow stepping around this. Great, thank Even, you. Yeah, that's all. Okay, yeah. great, thank you so much. Um, legalization of marijuana, and we're going to start with Laura Potter. Um, at, at the federal level. Yeah. At the federal level. Yeah. Just like the prohibition against alcohol years ago, the prohibition needs to end. Study after study after study is showing not only is it not harmful, marijuana is quite medicinal in many purposes. And recent studies are even coming out that for most people, there is negligible effect, you know, so if you smoke a joint, you can drive safely. You're more likely to drive more carefully because you're kind of more focused. It's, it's something that was pretty much made illegal in the first place because of racism, years and years and years ago, uh, I say years and years, 1930s, basically, when a lot of it came from the jazz, uh, the various jazz groups and the people that liked to enjoy them. They smoke a joint. Distinction between decriminalization and legalization. Do you have a quick? I think it should be legal, legalized. Mm -hmm. Decrim. That's kind of what we have in Vermont right now, is more of a decriminalization. But there are still numerous places where you can be arrested um, on, you know, and it's, Thank no, it needs, it needs to be totally legalized and at worst treated like alcohol in, in Great. Thank you so much. state stores. Anya, legalization of marijuana on the federal level. I don't support that. I view it as a state's issue. I'm not looking to um, legalize it federally. I think that there's been <coughs> evidence of traffic incidents on the rise in the states that have done it. Um, I just, I'm not, I, I won't expound further. I'll save the time. And do you think there should be penalties um, on states who are choosing to do that by the federal government? Currently the federal government does not um, recognize the states that do that as being a 
legal form. Of, so technically, it is still illegal federally, even though the states yeah. have decriminalized yeah. it. And how the states choose to deal with that with the federal government, I think that they will have to work out. But I do not support um, the federal government recognizing this as okay. I think that currently the federal government recognizes it under states' rights. Great. Thanks so much. Congressman. Um, well, I favor this, keeping this as a decision the state makes, and I would favor Vermont uh, making a, a, a marijuana legal. Uh, at the federal level, my view is that the federal government <clears throat> should defer to the states, which they don't do now. So if a state like Colorado passes a law that legalizes it, I think the, the federal government should not prosecute <clears throat> for that and should defer to the state decision. I think at the federal level, we should definitely legalize medical marijuana, something we did in Vermont uh, some years ago, uh, because there is medicinal benefit. And I don't mm -hmm. think the federal government should get between a doctor and the patient and what prescription that doctor and patient think makes sense for that person. So have the federal government defer to the state, respect the state decision, and at the federal level, have us acknowledge that medical marijuana should be legal everywhere. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Chris Erickson. I am 100% in favor of making <clears throat> marijuana 100% legal under federal law and hemp 100% legal under federal law. <clears throat> My great 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 grandparents owned the hemp lawn farm on the Benson Pike in Shelbyville, Kentucky. They had slaves. I still have some of the slave documents. They even bought and sold children's slaves. Slavery was outlawed. My, when my grandfather was born, George, George Robert Erickson, he was born in 1898. I am 66 years old. And the slaves were gone. And then the federal government came in and made hemp and marijuana <coughs> illegal. There went the family farm. Then they started arresting black people in the large numbers and compared to white people for using marijuana and they filled the prisons with black people. Now this made a new kind of slavery. So they ended the old kind of slavery and they made a new kind of slavery. And now we have another, a third kind of slavery, which I've talked to you about. Um, the ROI, we're not getting a return on investment, and that's a new kind of slavery where we pay our federal taxes, the federal government votes to give them to pharmaceutical companies who have replaced marijuana <coughs> and, with their prescription opioid drugs, and they're making trillions of profit, but we're paying for the research, design, and development. We're not getting any return on our investment. That's a new kind of slavery. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to remind viewers that you can call in 802-862-3966 if you have a question for the U.S. Um, congressional candidates. Um, I'm going to go to another question that came in um, t from the public via our online question <laughs> form. And that is, do you support statehood for Puerto Rico? And if not, how would you address the fact <clears throat> that the people of Puerto Rico are denied representation and are continually exploited by the U.S. government? And I think we are going to start with Anya. First of all, I think that it's important to ask Puerto Rico whether they are looking to be a state. <laughs> I haven't really heard anything on there. And uh, if they wish to become a state, I'm sure that there is a definite ability of looking into that and how it would work and what would be changed in their country to align with the U.S. more closely. Um, I'm not against it. If they so wish to go down that road, I'm not against that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I support statehood. It would be a decision Puerto Rico would have to vote on. Uh, and if they voted that they wanted to become a part of the United States as a state, I would support that. Um, I would do that for D.C. as well. And so this, Puerto Rico has not voted on statehood? My they have not? Currently not that I'm okay. aware of. All right. Great, thanks. Hmm. Chris? I'm 100% in favor of Puerto Rico receiving statehood. They already vote in our elections, and they have a right to be a state of the United <coughs> States of America. Um, thanks. Kind of need to correct that because most, uh, because they're a territory and not a state, most votes they aren't allowed to do. But they mm -hmm. vote in our federal elections. 
Um, not I, to my I knowledge. Thought they, I thought they got to vote <coughs> for president. Um, th they vote for a delegate. They have a delegate they in de Congress. They have the a delegate dele in Congress. So they vote. Okay, so they, they vote the for delegate, a delegate in Congress. But the delegate doesn't have the authority to vote on a lot of issues. So they vote for a delegate in Congress, and then the delegate is duct taped around the mouth. Yeah, well, that's what some of the delegates would say. That's true mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, for some of the islands. It's also true for the state of Wa or for the, the District of Columbia. You know, I think Washington. we need a we need a lot more information on what's going on, because it, it seems to me that they really should be a state. Great. Thank you, oh. Laura. I mean, you can continue. I think you were yeah. <laughs> having grown up. Thanks for sharing and, your time. Uh, in Florida, I ran into a lot of Cubans. In fact, well, my friends were Cuban, Puerto Rican. Uh, a, there were quite a number of Greek, uh, both new immigrants and people that had been there a while in Tarpon Springs. Um, but on the on the Puerto Rico issue. There has been discussion, there have been repeated votes, and some have gone each way. You know, the problem is, like the most recent one did say, yes, we want to become a state. And there's a lot of us who are saying, are you sure about that right now? We got some things to sort out on the mainland before, before we let anybody else in, you know? I'm, I'm all for statehood. But with the current, the current state of the U.S. at you know at this time, I don't think it would be a good idea. All right, thank you so much. So we have a uh, a question here, and I'm going to read it, <coughs> and then I'm going to uh, format it for all of us, um, or all of you sitting at the table. Uh, it says here that um, the Democrats unequivocally vote no to anything President Trump wants to push. Why is such obstructionism done by all Democrats? which results in hate and divisiveness in America. Why can't the Democrats ever give President Trump a chance? And so I think I'll, I'll pass that around the table and you can respond to it. Is there um, something that you think, is there some leeway uh, or something that you would recognize um, in the work that President Trump has done that you think is important? And I think, yeah, that's right, we are with you. Well, two, two reasons. First of all, there is way too much division. So the, the point you're making, I agree with. But second, you got to call it as you see it. So, for instance, I introduced a bill that would uh, protect pharmacists from being gagged, not being able to speak, to tell their customer that if they paid cash, they it would cost them less than if they used insurance. And the pharma companies imposed a gag rule. I introduced legislation, the president signed it. He and I agreed on that. Uh, the president just signed some opioid legislation that was a big bill that had a lot of Democratic and a lot of uh, Republican provisions in it. Four of them were mine, and the president signed that. So I want to work with him or anybody else when it is something that's going to be good for Vermont and good for the nation. So yes, anytime we can work together, let's do it. Great. Thanks. Chris Erickson, is there anything you want to recognize that this current president has done, um, or do you think standing in his way is a good idea? I think the Democrats are standing in President Trump's way, and they would stand in any Republican president's way, because they want to get more votes, they want to get more voters, and they want to win control of the U.S. Congress in this midterm <clears throat> election. And they're cheating. The Democrats are cheating. The Republicans are cheating. And this is the one, just one of the ways they cheat. You pay your tax dollars. The United States Congress, which is in charge of spending your tax dollars, votes to give your ta tax dollars to public broadcasting. Public broadcasting gives some of your tax dollars to Vermont PBS and to Vermont Public Radio. Vermont Public Radio and Vermont PBS exclude candidates like me, Chris Erickson, independent, from debates and forums. So they are committing fraud in a fiduciary capacity against their nonprofit status. And little Miss Anya Tinio and Peter Welch here are co-conspirators to fraud. They are committing campaign fraud. 
They are committing fraud in a fiduciary capacity because you are co-conspiring with Vermont PBS and Vermont Public Radio to use taxpayer dollars to promote your campaigns and exclude me, which is a violation of their nonprofit status. You're committing fraud in a fiduciary a capacity, question. and you're both evil. We got a question that will follow up with um, Laura Potter. <clears throat> okay, run the question by me again, because that... It's, it's the basic tenant is, um, is there anything that President Trump has done that you... Um, Okay. Support and um, back, back do you think to the Democrats focus because it went so far afield. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. I've just I've seen a gradual progression to more and more corporatism, more and more, um, more and more people taking control of of the general resources. Um, this administration, especially is doing some rather egregious moves. And the fact is, the very same party that is objecting to so-called Democrat obstruction <clears throat> was doing the very same thing when Obama was in power. And, you know, anything he wanted to do got blocked. Again, we're getting just these two gangs fighting. We have, you know, we have to end that. I don't like most of what this administration's doing. And that's why I'm here <clears throat> standing for a, for a position in Congress to try to make changes. And I mean, it flabbergasts me that people are, are so willing to accept, you know, two bulls locking horns Rather than maybe trimming their horns a bit so they can't lock them, you know, putting in some rules to force them to not just completely obstruct each other. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to skip to this question on open media, which is a little self-serving, but it also follows up on Chris's um, point, which is that falling cable... Ro oh. You didn't get your chance to speak. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, I, I can make it very short. Um, you don't need to. You I can don't, take your full time. I don't claim to know what the reason that people do things that they do. I don't speak for anybody but mm -hmm. myself. Uh, it does appear that there is an agenda from the left to consistently block anything that President Trump brings forward. But as I said earlier, I think that common sense transcends political barriers, as you were speaking of the different bills that President Trump signed and that you may have brought forth. And I'm sure that any good leader needs to look at all sides and make a decision based on that. And I do know that that's what I would do in Washington. And it's very important to stand up for what you believe in and what you know that your constituents voted for you to do. So that's. And are there specific measures that Trump has put forth that you would support um, by measures, the executive orders or? Currently, I support the taxes and tariffs. Um, I support what he did with the Jobs Act. I support the different things that he's doing for agriculture. I think that we're in a time of transition, and a time of transition is often uncomfortable, mm. but in the end, we will be better off for it. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, all right, so back to the open media. So falling cable revenue uh, threatens the future of community access channels like Hours here, Channel 17 Town Meeting TV. And our, um, right now the FCC is threatening to change current rules that provide funding for this open media platform. Do you support open media platforms such as Channel 17 Town Meeting Television? And if so, um, how would you suggest or help to continue, help them continue? And I guess we will start with, who are we starting with? Now I've lost my, are we starting with Chris? Chris. Start Thank with you me because so I'm mad as hell. Excellent. I'm, I'm mad as hell. You've been mad as hell for a minute I, and a half. At, at Community Access Television in Vermont. Let me give you an example. In August I came here um, and in September and 
I, I did some videos. Um, I was only allowed 20 minutes for my governor campaign. Laura Glenn Davidian wouldn't let me have 20 minutes for my campaign for U.S. Congress. I run for two offices because I'm excluded from so many debates. <clears throat> I might as well run for two offices. Now, I asked Cat TV in Bennington if they would air one of the videos fr from here, from CCTV, and they refused. <clears throat> and they gave a list of excuses refusing. And I would I, I object and say, your excuse is invalid. And they would send me another letter, another email with another excuse of why they couldn't air a video made here at CCTV that had me in it. And then I would re email back, and then they'd send another ridiculous excuse of why they couldn't air a video on Cat TV in Bennington, which is a community access channel of a video that was made here. And then I said, well, how about the video I made at BCTV in, ben in um, Brattleboro, Vermont? Oh, no, Cat TV in Bennington couldn't air that either. And they made up another excuse. I've had so many excuses from so many community access TV stations in Vermont re refusing to air videos of me as an independent candidate. I should be able to use community access TV. I'm on the statewide ballot in every single county in the state. And each of these community access stations that are refusing to air videos of me made at other community access stations are depriving voters of the right to know who is on the ballot. Great. And we are really excited. And they don't deserve a penny. Thank you. All the stations that have refused to air me do not deserve a penny. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Laura Potter, on the issue of community media and how should it be funded if you support it? Um, and if not, why not? As a former journalist, although I was a financial print journalist, and helped the particular company I was working for get onto the net in its early days, um, I've tended to be very much pro the public access. Um, public access both as far as uh, community TV as well as PBS, VPR, uh, correct, NPR being national, um, they need the monies, they need the freedom to put on what the communities want. And this, this stuff of this great sponsorship, but no support from the people, I mean, right now, VPR for one is large, is much largely supported by uh, by their funding runs every uh, members viewers listeners yeah, yeah. they're listeners I'm sorry tongue tied okay. today no um, you know we need to be putting the monies back into the arts back into communications as far as paying for it I mentioned it earlier we have a bloated military budget I'm not talking about cutting our actual defense. I'm talking about skimming the, the pork off of the top. And that money can go right back to where it's been taken from. And, you know. Thank you so much. I think that community access is valuable to tight-knit communities that may not have a larger media source. Uh, from a public television, VPR, nationally public television, and NPR all provide a service that is necessary, I would say. I think that there does need to be looked into reducing what the government funds of it. I think that keeps it more independent, truthfully. And I think that looking into corporate sponsorships and, of course, they have their fundraising drives and all of those things could be maybe forwarded more to the forefront, but being public television and public radio, I'm sure that it will always maintain some level of government support. And to be clear, um, we are funded with cable revenues, which, are, which we receive because of government regulation that requires basically a corporate sponsorship or mm -hmm. basically a corporate return on the public rights of way use. Mm -hmm. So um, that's right now. The that's FCC what we're controls at. a lot uh, in this arena and I think that they're they're working towards how that is going to be fiscally possible and how to maintain freedom of the media. Yeah. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I think we need uh, local TV like this more than ever. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the media is getting, uh, two things are happening. It's getting very fragmented where everybody goes to the cable news source that, that they prefer. Um, and it's getting dominated by large corporations. And it's losing its connection to the local communities. Like, for instance, Channel 3 had been run by a family uh, for, I think, over 60 years. And they were totally in engaged in the community. It's now owned by a big, large national broadcaster. And let's hope it maintains its focus on local news. But that localism is really important for all our communities. And we're starting to lose that. To some extent, the FCC is facilitating that. So this station, uh, and stations like this in our communities around the state, I think have a very important role to play. The FCC has to uh, come up with mechanisms with cable revenues being down, I guess to some extent, to make certain that we are adequately funding the very local uh, contribution that uh, Channel 17 makes in this community. Great. And um just a real quick follow-up on that is the sort of the whole issue of um, what President Trump refers to as fake news or um, calling out against the media, the rhetoric that he's been promulgating against the media. And in light of, I think there were 52 attacks on journalists or murders of journalists worldwide um, this past year. Um, I learned this yesterday. The friends of the Vermont State House had a, State House held a conference on fake news, and I wonder if you would all just respond to that briefly. Well, obviously, Vermont Public Radio and Vermont PBS commit fake news when they say that there are <coughs> two candidates for U.S. Congress. These two evil fake news candidates, Tinio and Welch, who are not the only two candidates for U.S. Congress, but Vermont Public Radio and Vermont PBS <coughs> commit fake news when they hold debates with only two candidates who are so inhuman and so black-hearted that they wouldn't say, excuse me, but where are the other candidates? You are so self-centered, so inhuman, and so black-hearted that you didn't speak up and say that the rest of the candidates should be invited. And that's what you would do if you were elected, and it's what you have done. You've lied in the past, you've voted to lower food stamps for the most vulnerable Vermonters, totally and not you true. are no better because that you is, didn't that speak is up. Not true. You voted to lower food stamps. Yes, I, you did. I, Ms. Erickson, we're trying not. to have a pleasant yeah, no, conversation No, there's nothing pleasant here. about you keep because your tone down. you're nothing but a conceited little Brennan. missy who, who well, your conspired. Your opinion of me needs to be toned conspired. down. No, it doesn't. You yes. conspired. You conspired to we'll give exclude you a chance me to from respond. debates. We'll give you a 30-second chance to respond. You conspired to exclude me from debates. Thank you, conspired you Chris Erickson. I would think that this behavior may be why PBS doesn't include you. No, thank you. Laura Potter, on uh, your opinion on fake news and um, the calls of the, you know, the media spinning things out of control. Thank you. Fake news used to be those tabloids that you found in, you know, in the grocery store on your way out. That was entertainment. It was fake news. Might read, you know, read like real news. But I really have seen very little honestly fake news on any media. What I have been seeing is the, I guess the proper term on this would be the slant. You've got conservative slant, you've got progressive slant, you've got centrist, you've got some that really take that over. You know, you look at the news, the core news is there. What's around it is all the opinion and the slant of the particular uh, particular publishers, whether it's TV or print, you know. The fake news, this harks back to previous days, calling things fake and, you know, trying to, trying to get people turned against the press. And the free press is in our Constitution the only other thing is the Postal Service. And these two have been under major attack. Great. Thank you so much. I think when I look at a news story, 
I read three or four versions of the same story to try and pick out which fact seems to be the one common thread between the four. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that it's necessary to do that due to there is a slant depending on who you're reading it from. So is there fake news? In a sense, there is. And I think personally have had a few experiences that have led me to that conclusion as well. As far as journalism goes, journalism is and continues to be a very dangerous job around the globe in some of these other countries and we do need to guard against it becoming that way in America as well. Freedom of the press is very important. I'm 100% for constitutional rights and that is one of them. Thanks so much. Well, freedom of the press is a bedrock constitutional right and an absolute necessity uh, to maintain a democracy. And uh, journalists are under assault. And just look what happened to Mr. Khashoggi uh, when he was murdered. And now the Saudis are acknowledging that it was a premeditated murder. What was his crime? He did mild criticism of the Saudi regime. That is terrible. Uh, the fake news, uh, that has really been something where I think President Trump has is, is, is promoted that to discredit any kind of news story. Uh, and I do disagree with the president in, tr in constantly attacking journalists as peddling fake news. There is a job that journalists have, and that's to adhere to editorial standards, to fact check, to have sources, to do things that can back up their stories. There's a duty that we as citizens have, and that's to use our own judgment when we're reading a story to try to figure out what's the, ba the bias, what's the slant and come to our own conclusion. But in order for us to be able to do that as citizens, we have to have uh, credible sources of news. And hopefully it's in all the different kinds of media. And that's getting more and more fragmented uh, as the uh, citizenry goes to whatever the cable news program is that reinforces their point of view. And did you want to take uh, 10 seconds to rebut the issue of food stamps? Oh, it, it, Chris, that's just flat out false. No, it I mean, isn't, so Chris. Okay. It is an absolute fact that you voted to lower food stamps. Chris, um, excuse me. Uh, the, sorry, the, sorry. The, the bill that I voted against lowered food stamps. And a major reason I voted against the farm bill in the House was because it cut food stamps by $23 billion. You cut food stamps. You voted to cut food right, stamps. I'm going to go lied. to a... No, because he's lied before. You lied before in a debate in 2014, and you said that you didn't take so money from defense contractors. When in, in the same week, no, in the same week, Thank you very in the much. same week, you were in the Burlington Free Press. We're going to go now with, to with a phone call from the public. Showing your gonna, check that you received from the defense contractors. So you lied about that. Be, instead of, we're going to do this last phone call. Sure. Question, okay. And then that'll probably be yeah. also your time for your closing statement. Okay. So, welcome. You're on the air. Uh, good evening. Thank you for taking my call. This uh, this question becomes quite timely with the conduct of the panelists here. Um, I know one of the candidates has taken the high road in dealing with the foolishness coming out of the president's office. Um, I say the foolishness coming out of President Trump. I do not disparage the office. Can you get to your question? The conduct of the president. Uh, this question goes to all four people, but Representative Welch is all, has already taken the high road. I would like a promise from the other three candidates that they would take the high road in dealing with issues rather than the nonsense coming out of the presidential right. office and uh, take the high road. Uh, I would like that commitment from all candidates even though uh, right. Representative Welch has already done that. Thank Thanks you. so much. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, go around, we'll do closing statements, and you can decide if you want to also um, choose to respond to the questioner about taking the high road. I think we've all heard from everybody on that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for closing statements, we're going to start with Laura Potter. <laughs> is that right? Is that where we're at in the turn? Yeah, I think I that's think, where we're at. I think so. We we bobbled a little bit there. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Um, closing statement. I'm Laura Potter. I'm with Liberty Union Party, Vermont's homegrown, nonviolent, revolutionary party. We are una unabashedly socialist. We're interested in 
doing things for the common people, not for the rich, not for massive corporations. Um, and as far as taking the high road, that has been the whole idea. You know, that's why I who, I hate politics. I hate getting in the middle of, of battles between people. You know, good debate, this works. But the battles that I've been seeing, I finally put, I finally stood for an office for the very reason that we, we need to get back to the high road, back to caring. What have we done? We've hardened our hearts. We need to get back to caring about each other and actually taking care of them. Cutting food stamps, cutting all these medical benefits, cutting, cutting, cutting. And meanwhile, there are those who are getting filthy rich. There's a problem. That's why I'm here. And that's why I came in attempting to take the high road. I'm, gl I'm glad to see that at least one other on this panel is doing likewise. Great. Thank you so much. And I hope that it's f two others. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Anya Tino, running for U.S. House, in case nobody caught that yet. <laughs> I appreciate this forum. I appreciate the chance to talk about the different ideas that we all have. Ultimately, we have less than two weeks to the election, and you will make up your minds about who you want to represent you. To me, this election is about freedom. This is about the freedoms that we enjoy every day as American citizens and not diminishing that. And every single one of you will have to make up your own mind and your own heart whether or not that is the most important thing to you in this election. I will support the Constitution. I will fight for your rights in Washington. I will work to improve our economy, help our agricultural community, and I do believe that the state of Vermont can be represented in Washington by somebody who has a working class background and understands the struggles that you face every day. I appreciate your vote on November 6th, and I always try to take the high road. Thanks so much. Uh, well, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here uh, with my colleagues. Uh, this is really an important election, and it was summed up for me when I was at an event with lots of people there, and a Marine came up, a former Marine who'd served six years, and he said, Peter, I agree with you on a lot of your issues, like climate change and Medicare for all, uh, but he said, you know, this election, we're fighting for our freedoms. We're fighting f for democracy. You know, the rule of law is being challenged. Uh, the role of journalism is being challenged. Uh, d the truth is being disregarded one day after another. And people are being vilified on the basis of their religion uh, or uh, their sexual orientation. And that's just not right. In a democracy, there has to be, has to be mutual respect. Uh, in Vermont, we've had that. We're so lucky with our town meeting tradition. You know, you go to town meeting and the debates are fierce. But you've got everybody who's debating in the morning working together to serve the meal in the, in, in, at lunch. And it's a recognition that we're all in it together. And what I'm seeing in Washington is very troubling to me is we're moving into this winner-take-all approach. And we've all got to be pulling together for the common good. And my hope is that we're going to get through what I think is a dark time and bring some Vermont values to Washington. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chris Erickson. Yes, my name is Chris Erickson. My website is indyvt.com. I'm racing to win Vermont. INDYVT.com. If you elect me to the United States Congress, one of the first things I'm going to do is get some of that ROI, return on investment, that we have a right to from our tax dollars. I'll run it by you real quick again. We pay our taxes. The United States Congress votes to give them to the Pentagon. The Pentagon votes to give millions to the defense contractors. The vent defense contractors invent all kinds of defense products, bombs and drones and so forth. They start with the copyright. Under copyright law, we have a right to ownership of these the profits because we paid for the research, design, and development. Now I'm going to demand ROI, return on investment, of the trillions of dollars the defense corporations are making. And I'm going to use that money 
and send it back to each of the 50 states. And in the state of Vermont, I'm going to use the return on investment from the trillions of dollars the defense corporations are making to make homes for homeless veterans. We have 40,000 homeless United States military veterans on any given night here in the United States of America. And even though the nonprofit organizations do the best they can, we still have 40,000 homeless U.S. military veterans on any given night in the United States of America, and half of them are black and Latino. Are you ready, Vermont? Are you ready, Vermonters? Because I will bring 20,000 homeless U.S. military veterans who are black and Latino, people of color, to Vermont. Thank so you stop so much. talking about racism. Let's do something about it. Thank you. Vote for me, Chris Erickson. Great. Thank you all for tuning in and watching the forum tonight. Again, this is one of 60 forums that we have. If you want to watch this one again or any of the others on local and statewide offices, uh, you can tune in at ch17.tv. I want to thank you all for being here with us tonight, one of the forums that has invited all of the candidates to attend. Um, and on Monday, uh, we will have nine candidates for the U.S. House, um, for the U.S. Senate. Um, and we'll be holding that forum at the Winooski O'Brien Center. It's open to the public, and it will also be live online. Thank you, and good night.